Welcome to TYT Interviews. Tonight I have the opportunity to speak with a criminal defense attorney, Pal Lengyel Lehu. Pal, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, if I start calling you Pal, it's not because I'm coddling the interview subject. That's, that's <laughs> my interview subject's name, so please forgive me for that. Pal is a criminal defense attorney here in Orange County, and recently Pal uh, defended uh, in some high-profile high, high cases of young Americans who were charged by the government of supporting ISIS. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But first, I want to give the audience a sense of what kind of work you do as a criminal defense attorney, whether you focus on these high-profile terrorism, politically charged cases, or whether you're a general criminal defense attorney, including the guy who punched someone out in the barroom brawl, and you just happen to do these cases as well. Uh, my practice has uh, been general law. Um, I was in the Marine Corps when I first got out of uh, law school, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and then when I went into private practice, I've done other things like insurance defense and personal injury cases, but I started focusing primarily on criminal law probably around 1999, 2000. Um, I do general criminal law, but mostly on the felony side, mostly serious cases. Mm -hmm. And I've represented defendants throughout the United States, probably in, I think at last check, around 36 different jurisdictions where I fly in and then represent them pro hoc vice, which is for that one case only, okay. and then fly out. Uh, these two particular cases uh, came to us through internet advertising where the families were looking for an attorney um, and in the one case uh, which would have been Adam Dandich his family uh, hired a law firm that I'm associated with and they asked me to handle the case okay through my representation of Adam um, you know I'd go down to the jail and I'd meet with him and I was I feel pretty respo uh, responsive to the family's requests for additional help. Um, they met the family of the next gentleman, right. Matter El Husayel, during visiting hours, and they suggested that uh, his family contact me for representation of the second one. Okay. And that's how I ended up with both. And that's how we are here. Now, I'm going to let you talk about the fact pattern in these cases because I want to be precise in what the charges were and what the names of the defendants were. So, wh where do you want to start? Can we? Talk about Nader Elhu Yaz Elhu. Nader would be the second case. That would be the that, second case. Um, and let's let's hold him off. Let's let's okay. start with Adam. Adam was the first gentleman that I met. Um, Adam was uh, picked up at John Wayne Airport, and he was uh, apparently not on anybody's radar. Um, and as the facts indicated, the FBI uh, contacted him as he was attempting to. Um, uh, purchase his or check in through his ticket mm -hmm. and uh, get to his plane which was going to take him ultimately to uh, the Middle East uh, specifically constant or Istanbul and in his case there were two charges and that was attempting to provide material support to a foreign terrorist organization it's a very specific charge in the US code in addition there was a charge that he had purposely uh, falsified an application for his passport, um, which is a separate charge completely and carries its own separate punishment. And what year are we talking about? That would have been 2014. Okay. And the terrorist organization that is alleged is ISIS in this case? or Well, it's we, had a lot, we had a lot of fighting about that. All right. Um, because, it, and it, it's a little esoteric, but uh, the group as it currently is represented is the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Baghdadi declares the new caliphate, this Islamic State, uh, to exist as of June of 2014. Right. And that's a very important date. And it's an important date for all of those individuals who are fighting in that region. Because prior to that time, there was a huge amount of conversations about starting a new caliphate, something similar to the Ottoman Empire that was dismantled after World War I. Right. And this is something that they were looking forward to. They were attempting to look for signs that would demonstrate that now is the time to declare it. And the sign that came was the fall of Mosul. Uh, the ISIS and ISIL fighters took that town and Baghdadi came out and he gave a speech and said, now we're declaring the Islamic State and we will never be called ISIS or ISIL ever again. Very significant date, because in both cases, both in Adam's case and in Natter's case, these individuals were at least ostensibly joining the caliphate, right. which 
as we were arguing to the court, is not on the list of terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. And it consequently makes prosecuting them complicated because in order to be guilty of attempting to assist a foreign terrorist organization, the foreign terrorist organization has to fit a certain definition by statute. And the Islamic State hasn't, been, hasn't fit that definition until after both gentlemen were actually arrested. But at the time, did the, formerly no, uh, uh, the organization formerly known as ISIS, or known to us as ISIS, was that categorized by the U.S. as a terrorist organization? Uh, yes, it, it had been okay. uh, about a month before. <laughs> right. uh, so as around May of uh, 2014 uh, is when they said ISIS and ISIL, which is actually the same name, it's just different nomenclature, yeah. uh, that group. But it, again, our argument I think is kind of interesting because that group was pretty much narrow in scope. They were just trying to cause an insurrection within the confines of originally Iraq. A after Obama moved the American forces out of Iraq, there was a power vacuum right. which Al-Qaeda in Iraq filled. And that's how ISIS grew up and ISIL grew up. That's why everyone blames uh, Barack Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton for, for causing them. Because that, 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 those are the pieces. Pull America out, this group starts fighting. Yeah. But their mission and their stated mission that they say in all their propaganda was that they were just going to cause problems with inside Iraq. When they move on to also cause problems in Syria, that's when they become ISIL. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole Levant. It's not until they become the caliphate where they become global. And I think a mission that's now global, where they can drop bombs in, in Paris, or where they're gonna drop bombs in Madrid, or they're gonna shoot up San Bernardino, that's a completely different mission. That's a completely different unit. Right. And that's something that should be taken and addressed separately. So let's step away from the case for just briefly. Okay. Do you have any objection, either in principle or legally or philosophically, to the, a U.S. law that makes it illegal to support, and I don't know their exact wording of the statute, a, a terrorist organization? Um, to pl to uh, pledge support to a terrorist without doing anything? Well, uh, you're now running directly into um, the, the, the constitutional um, uh, privilege of freedom of speech and freedom of association. Mm -hmm. uh, there once was a time where the country was uh, ferreting out communists, and uh, the senator from Wisconsin was looking for people that have uh, now or sometime in the past been associated with the Communist Party. Right. And the Supreme Court said very clearly that it is not illegal to be a member of the Communist Party. Or it's not illegal to be a member of a group that uh, believes in the overthrow of the American government. And at that time, the Communist Party in the Soviet Union was an enemy of the United States. But I mean, the Soviet Union was an enemy. The, the Communist Party, not necessarily. Maybe not the Communist Party, right. but the principles were definitely anathema yeah. to uh, American constitutional principles. The Nazis were allowed to march in Skokie. Right. Uh, even though we were at war with the Nazis at one point. Um, so now you have a group of people that want to advocate a different political point of view albeit abhorrent to us, as Americans, our Supreme Court in, in Holder, in the Holder decision, which came out recently, it's a Ninth Circuit Court of Opinion, uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision that went up to the Supremes, and it held that as an American individual, you can um, advocate on behalf of ISIS and ISIL. Oh, really? Okay. Because it's not the advocacy, it's the attempt to support uh -huh. a foreign terrorist organization. It's a fine distinction that's difficult to make. And the support it can be going over there yourself. The material support can be yourself, or sure. sending money, or material. or material. We would think of it as weapons, or bullets, or, mm -hmm. or cash. But if you actually plan to travel over there for that purpose of joining up, you fall afoul of that statute. Uh, was this decision you're calling the Holder decision in effect at the time of your Adam case? Yeah, both of them. Okay. Uh, and, and we brought that up with the court um, in both cases, saying that it, it seems incongruous to be trying them for that which the court said is allowed, even though there are other decisions over these travel type cases that said, no, they, they breached the statute by attempting to go over there. They catch them at the airport. Some of these guys actually made it over there to Istanbul, or they made it over to Syria, and they right. catch them over there. Those are a little bit closer. 
I do have a problem with prosecuting someone who comes up with an idea but then doesn't do anything more than buy a ticket. Well, I have a problem too, which is why I, of all people, invited you to come in here. Uh, well, let me ask you something. Uh, do you happen to know and are you willing to talk about what Adam Dandich's intentions were? Well, the stated intentions and what he was has said at his sentencing hearing, and he has said repeatedly, uh, even in his original FBI uh, interview, was that he was hoping to uh, be a part of the humanitarian as assistance uh, to the people that were suffering under the wartime conditions. Now, he agreed philosophically and religiously mm -hmm. with the position of the Islamic State, at least with their religion and their politics, but he was totally opposed to the killings. He was totally opposed to what we would consider terrorist acts. But in his version of the Quran, I mean, there are capital punishments that are uh, meted out for sinful behavior. Right. And if you are a follower of the book as strictly as some members are, then you sort of say that that's okay. But he does not agree with the use of those kind of terrorist tactics where you're killing people or killing civilians solely for the purpose of trying to influence governments or, or population. Which is what most people use as the definition of terrorism. Exactly, exactly. Uh, now, okay, what was the result of the case? He was convicted on which charges, all or what? Both, both charges um, based on a plea um, and uh, as a result of the plea, the, the judge awarded 15 years. Oh, so he, he, ple he pled. Yes. And both, by both charges, you mean the passport, the passport charge and assisting, the charge of assisting. Attempting, to, attempting assist. to assist. Does this, does these kind of prosecutions occur in the United States with respect to other groups like some terrorist paramilitary in Colombia or whatever other terrorists in Asia or Africa? Oh, most definitely. Most okay, definitely. So what I want to get at here is the government putting extra attention, maybe unfair attention, on people who declare or in some way state their affinity for the Muslim terrorist groups or the Middle Eastern terrorist groups? Or is the government really going after whether it's in Asia or Middle East or South America or Latin America? Any? Well, it, 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 in my, because I had two cases dealing specifically with the ISIS-ISIL connection, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to ferret out what, what the government's role is here. And the best I can tell is, it reminds me after 9-11. Remember after 9-11, there was all the uh, soldiers in the terminals with their machine guns? Yeah. They weren't doing anything. Right. And so it was the perception, it was theater. Right. The perception that we're gonna have to do something, so we're gonna arm guys at security, but no one's attacking the terminals. But it gave the Americans the impression that, uh, that the government was doing something. These prosecutions, I think, are doing the same thing. Um, and I think they start from the horrible position of this Patriot Act. With the Patriot Act, we have now no longer required probable cause to search people's communications, which when you have an open-ended warfare on, uh, on terrorism, which is never gonna end, they'll always have a war on terrorism, it's like war on drugs, right. it's always going to exist, they could suspend the Fourth Amendment privilege against unreasonable searches and seizures indefinitely, indefinitely. Yeah. until someone finally says, okay, terrorism's over, which will never happen in any of our lifetimes. Now, these arguments, which I concur with, did you bring these up in the trial? Is this part of what motivated you to, to make this defense, to raise these issues in a public forum? Well, not yes and no. I, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. Mm -hmm. My job is to be the mouthpiece for my client. Right. And it's really hard for people that aren't involved in it to say, well, how could you possibly defend someone like that? Because that's my job. I, and the system needs it. it so, sometimes these people who are accused are innocent, completely innocent. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they are. Yeah. Uh, and, but, but that's not the point. Mm. E even the guilty deserve an yes. absolute fair uh, 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 argument on their side. So I need to say the things that the, more effectively than they could say for themselves. Right. And, and that, because I practice it, I do it all the time. I pick juries, I'm cross-examining witnesses, I'm going after the FBI. I don't have uh, uh, preconceived notions that everyone's telling the truth in court. I have to ferret out where they're lying. I can do that more effectively than some poor schmuck who got picked up at the airport and all he wanted to do 
was go over there and help the widows and orphans. Right. But is your motivation to be as good a criminal defense attorney as you can be, or are you trying to wake the public up to what's possibly a little overreach of government power in these cases? I, I, I can't place myself in a position. I don't have you know this kind of audience. My mm -hmm. audience is 12 people in the box right. and two people that are alternates. But the newspapers write about your case, at least these two cases. These were high profile cases. They, they were. And, and I would like to think that the people that read those articles or see this presentation will sit back and think, is this the right thing for our country to do? I mean, is this really the America that we want? I, I am all for security, mm -hmm. but there's a limit between security and freedom. And if we're going to be at war for the rest of our existence, then we're going to have to admit that our freedoms are going to be cut back. If the First Amendment says that I can say or advocate virtually any position, then you can't be prosecuting kids for twittering, right. which is what's going on in Missouri right now. They've got that woman under a federal indictment for retweeting what somebody else wrote. I mean, what, when did that become okay? Yeah, I'm not familiar with the case. Briefly, what? She, there is a woman in Missouri who was just indicted about a month ago, and, and th what I could read from the news, her only offense, and I also read the complaint that was filed, her only w offense was to take pro-ISIS and okay, ISIL tweets that, right. that were sent to her mm -hmm. and retweeting them. Now, if that is a criminal offense in America, then let's just say that up front, that, 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 that this type of... Uh, advocacy is no longer permitted. There, there is a case also out of the Ninth Circuit um, which prohibits lawyers from filing briefs on behalf of terrorist organizations. Right. That's, that's con contrary to our system, of course. You would think it would be. But uh, in a legal discussion, you always got to make comparisons. Sometimes they're flawed. But just to, for my edification and for the audience, is there an equivalent for just, say, regular murder, if there's somebody who in his or her bedroom is typing threatening messages and planning by writing little notes to him or herself about killing people uh, and, and the authorities discover it, what is the level of prosecution and potential sentencing that, can, uh, that some person like that can face? Oh, if it's communicating a threat, it's usually pretty minor. It, it, I've seen a lot of those cases in the context of boyfriends and girlfriends, mm -hmm. uh, exes, um, I've done those type of cases, and they're, they're, in the grand scheme of things, they're, they're less than 10 years, probably around five, depending on the level of the threat, and if the, uh, obviously if the person can actually carry it out. Um, so, I mean, it, it's not quite as significant as something like this, where you're talking about um, years. Yeah, uh, decades. 30 years, 15 years, uh, 25 years for the individuals that are going to trial on these type of charges. These are lifetimes that they're taking away from individuals uh, based on things that they said with absolutely no, um, in my opinion, no clear route to committing any of the crimes that they're accused of attempting to commit. Yeah, and never mind the route, they haven't actually done that. We've got, we gave cases to the judge in, in Natter's case because he is being accused of conspiracy and the attempt to uh, provide material aid to a foreign terrorist organization, an attempt and a conspiracy. We showed the judge cases where individuals not only were casing a bank, but brought the weapons, got the getaway car, had maps, went to the bank, mm -hmm. and then turned around and left. Changed their mind for whatever okay. reason. They've arrived at the scene of where the crime is supposed to take place. Right. Natter didn't even make it through security. Yeah. He gets picked up at the counter at LAX. And, and, and our jurisdiction or our jurisprudence has typically said that we want to give criminals an opportunity to forego their criminal behavior. So they have to be close enough that we can decide that but for uh, the interference by um, uh, the police, the crime would have been committed. Mm -hmm. the inchoate crimes. We, we want to get really close. Right. Because we want to give them a chance to say, I don't want to do it. Yeah. Here, he had no, in Natter's case. Yeah, well, we have to talk about the facts in Natter's case uh, now that we're into it. Uh, Natter, the, the, the facts that came out were, um, there, there, there was a lot of Twitter, there was a lot of language, there was a lot of support of what we call ISIS or ISIL or the Islamic State. Uh, and and there, there, there seems that the group that he was 
most vocal with were all in support of what was going on and mm -hmm. and they were looking for a, a caliphate to be established and a, a land that would be primarily the religious group that they uh, affiliated with that's fine so in his case uh, it was a Patriot Act case um, and the authorities had identified them and there was evidence of surveillance and but it's all talk right everything all the evidence was just talk uh, he had more than one charge in addition to the conspiracy to aid he also had some bank fraud charges um, approximately 14 of them that were based on checks and and depositing checks in different banks but for us the the, the thrust of the case was whether or not this is ma material support to a foreign terrorist organization in his situation he had a friend um, buy him a ticket online, so they used to hit the other friend's credit card, right. which he paid for, and the ticket was going to get him to Istanbul and then and on Israel. to Tel Aviv. Right. He's from Israel. He has an Israeli passport. He had an online relationship with a young woman who he was going to marry. Right. Um, all of that evidence was available. The, the luggage was checked through to Tel Aviv, and when we opened up the luggage in court, it had two-piece suits mm -hmm. and, 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 and shoes that, that were for a wedding, not for running around like a Mujahideen. <laughs> I mean, and he had an Israeli passport. He didn't speak Arabic, uh, and he's from America. Uh, you know, three strikes. I don't think he would have gotten past the border. Yeah. Um, he had no connection. In fact, the FBI testified that he had a plan to make a plan. And that's when we were yelling up and down. That's not close enough. A plan to make a plan is not conspiracy or attempt. And we're going to hope that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has a chance to look at that. But meanwhile, he was convicted in the trial court. Absolutely. Do you, why do you think he was convicted, given the, the way you perceive the evidence? Um, unfortunately, the, the judge um, took the jury back into chambers, and we didn't really have an opportunity to interview them mm -hmm. to get their point of view. I do know that Orlando had a significant effect on some of them. Uh, the Orlando shootings took place oh. while our trial was going oh, okay. on. Uh, we asked them all to set that aside. Uh, they promised that they, they weren't would. sequestered. Uh, no, they were not sequestered. So, um, and in fact, one lady said she couldn't continue uh, because it had upset her so much. But other than that, um, we don't know. I mean, everything—it's all guesswork. Right. Um. Okay, so it's being appealed. Uh, the, the conviction was 30 years in that case. That's where you referenced 30 years. Uh, yeah. Anyway. But did you also, it's not important, but the bank fraud charges, did you defend th against those charges? or Absolutely. Or, okay. Was he, and he was convicted on those as well? Does Absolutely. Does that add to this? Okay. Well. And, and, and I think uh, the, the facts of the, the videos that they had and, uh, and some of the evidence that they had might have colored the jury, uh, saying that if, if he did this, he must have done that. There might have been some of that, although we were able to show that they didn't have evidence for everything that they were asking for. Um, and I think there were some gaps that, you know, on appeal that they can be looked at and determine whether or not he is involved. Well, we'll see what happens. Involved. But now let's speak more broadly, as you started to earlier with me, on what is going on here. What, why is, is this the right approach that the U.S. government should take in combating, in quotes, terrorism. Uh, well, we were talking I, before we got started about yeah. that, and, and, and fundamentally, if, if we're going to be at war with terrorism throughout the globe, then we're, we should apply the usual principles of, of the, the laws of war. And the one that comes to mind most regularly is, of course, the Geneva Convention. The Geneva, Geneva Convention prohibits the prosecution in the criminal process of enemy combatants. And if these individuals are our enemy and they are combatants because they're picking up weapons and shooting at us, then the Geneva Convention says we can't put them in jail for that. Now we can lock them up at you know, Guantanamo Bay, uh, we can lock them up in prisoner or war camps until the ending of hostilities. But this is where the problem begins. If we do not extend the privileges under the Geneva Convention to their combatants, then they are not obliged morally or ethically to do mm -hmm. the same to us and our troops, because our troops, if they're going to put boots on the ground there, they're going to get captured. 
And when that occurs, we are giving them carte blanche. And that, I, I, I think that's a, that's a failed policy from the beginning. Because what makes these cases different is these are American citizens that we're talking about, that you defended, mm -hmm. who are uh, alleged to support the, these organizations. So they have boots on all the different grounds. Our home turf, they're trying to get to the, to the, the foreign soil. And all the issues you, you raise here, of course, is what is prominently in discussions at the public level about the detainees at Guantanamo Bay and how long they're going to be there, and also in Air Force and other locations in Afghanistan and, and uh, all the enemy combatants that we've detained and continue to detain well, in that, this endless war that's not a declared war. And, and, that, and that this is going back to Korea and, and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. our, our new method of combat is to avoid declaring war. And if we're going to avoid declaring war, then we've, we've opened up a whole different swamp that we should at least have clear ideas of what is acceptable and what's prohibited. Because if the Supreme Court can tell us that we can cheerlead for ISIS and ISIL, and then we have the U.S. attorney bringing uh, prosecutions against individuals for doing exactly that, and convictions, then we're not getting a, a, unified, um, a, a unified position from our government. And what we're getting is doublespeak. Right. And, and as we pointed out, in Nader's case specifically, the Islamic State was not added to the list until September of 2015. And as I tried to point out to the jury and the judge and anybody who would listen, <laughs> when they argue that ISIS and ISIL and the Islamic State are all the same thing, then why were they added in September of 2015? Because if they didn't need to add them, then why would, and then what was interesting to me, is I didn't even know they added them. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a process they have where the Secretary of State talks with the Attorney General and Treasury, and they say, should we add this group to the terrorist list? And if all three of them agree, then they submit it to Congress, and 30 days later, they're added to the list. Right. Now, I've had these cases for a while, okay? So I've been following that list every single month, and it never came up. So I, I sent a motion to the judge. I said, throw this out. The Islamic State's not even on the list. And they came back and said, oh no, it was put on in September of 2015. It was totally secret. There's not a single press release that announced it. There was no information that was available on any of the websites that I was, and I was checking them all. It was buried in the Federal Register. And I don't know if you've ever seen the Federal Register. Things huge. Right. Nobody yes. reads it on a regular basis. Yeah. But it was never added to the actual, the, the State Department puts out a list of all of the organizations that are on the list. The Islamic State never appeared, not once. Yeah, um, uh, well, it sounds like a good legal argument, but for whatever reason that you're not aware of, it didn't fly with the did jury. Did not fly, the did not fly. Yeah, this brings up uh, what was going on with the in Irish Americans in the 70s and 80s. There must have been thousands of Americans who supported, in some capacity or another, the IRA, which was, a, I, I don't know if the U.S. declared it a terrorist organization, maybe they did. I, I don't think we had the statute back then, in, okay, but, the but statute there, didn't exist. there was something because Ted Kennedy was on the no-fly list, Right, Senator Ted Kennedy, because of his support for uh, the IRA. So I, there's got to be selective prosecution in this uh, area, oh, but uh, as you're, you're saying, there's, the statute wasn't even around back then. So You're right. There, there is a, it depends on what our government's foreign policy is at the moment and under which administration. Sure. And, and I think as a country, that's the one area that we've always stumbled is in foreign policy. We, we've done so well of attempting to do the right thing here, and I think for the most part we try to do the right thing here, but every time we get involved in foreign countries and influencing things around the world, we always manage to just mess it up and create unintended consequences and like backfires. Unintended consequences. Uh, how well do you remember the whole John Walker Lind case from Fascinating the beginning issue. of the uh, uh, Afghan war. Here's a guy, an American, who picks the other side. Right. Um, he was captured. And captured on the battlefield. Um, you know, Hemingway jumped into the Spanish Civil War, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> what would have happened if we had picked the other side of that? Um, I don't know. We believe in, we, we talk about freedom. We, we talk about everyone has the right to you know, choose their own path. I grew up in the 60s, America, love it or leave it. Here, my clients, 
in him. He chose to leave it. Yeah, I always thought it was strange. So this was way back in the first few months after 9-11 when we went into Afghanistan to throw out the Taliban. And everyone remembers John Walker Lynn because he was all over TV in right. his robe, w walking around kind of dazed. And I kept thinking, I know that it's easy for me to think any story that I want because I'm not a, a leader. I, I don't, my decisions don't have any impact. But I thought, all right, if this guy, an American citizen, decided to go be with the Taliban, you don't bring him back here and then try him and put him in jail. His punishment, let him stay with the Taliban. That's about <laughs> as bad a punishment as you can get. <laughs> but he decided to go over there. So, if, I don't know if it's illegal, cut off his American citizenship or, or not, and just let him stay there. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm on firm legal ground. I'm partially tongue-in-cheek with that, but that's kind of what my instinct was. I thought bringing him back and then prosecuting him just didn't sit well with me. I, I, have, I have so many problems with extra-jurisdictional, uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction. When, when Noriega, you know, down in Panama, mm -hmm. when we go into Panama and we capture him and bring him to the United States and put him on trial, even though he's never set foot in the United States. Right. Uh, now, admittedly, he was a CIA agent. Everyone believes that he was a CIA agent. Uh, so we have problems with that. But we could just go into other countries and capture people and bring them back. I mean, usually we ask the country to extradite, send people to us. Here in Noriega's case, the problem was that, of course, he was running the government. Yeah. We can't ask him to just send anybody. Himself. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we can't just go get So either we declare war on the country, but declaring uh, a subpoena on him is, sounds ridiculous. And, and here, he went over there before any known uh, 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 attack, mm -hmm. uh, any undeclared war, before 9-11, as far as we know. Uh, Plus, the, we were on the side of the Taliban at, yeah, at we one support point when they were fighting the Soviet Union. So it, it, Way back in the day, sure. Yeah. So it's full of contradictions. Uh, it, it depends on, uh, again, where, where the tides are blowing for the politicians to make up their mind. And, that's, and, and see, that's where I think Obama stumbled when the president said that we were going to prosecute this war based on the criminal justice system, I, I just thought that was a, a bad policy. Because if that's the case, then all of a sudden you're giving enemy combatants all of the rights of our Constitution. And, and they reject that anyway. They're not citizens of our country. Our Constitution applies within the confines of this country. Mm -hmm. That's why I thought Guantanamo Bay was a genius idea. Because it's not America. Well, it's a genius legal idea, but PR-wise, it was not a good idea. Well, course. where else are you going to house all the guys that we're fighting unless well, you're just going to turn them loose? They, the Bush administration went into this whole war on terrorism, as they called it, without a good plan. There was there's really no good solution for the guys that were detained and brought to Guantanamo. I don't know what we're supposed to do with them, legally or PR-wise or just in terms of justice. I, I, uh, time is playing out. That most of them are out of Guantanamo at this point, but there's still a few... I, I understand there's about 100 left or something like that? Some number like that. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was less than 100, fewer than 100. Uh, and they're returning to the combat. I, I've, I've read uh, several articles that say many of the high-profile ones have gone back and, and, and continued the fight wherever. Sure, although I've read several articles that many of them uh, were never in combat in the first place and they went back and, and they're just living their lives. They, 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 right, they, you've got both. They just got swept up and... All right, so other than the appeal of the Nader case, are you, is there anything else on your radar screen along these lines of these terrorism? Uh, mostly cases? just supporting other attorneys that are doing them. I've, mm -hmm. I've had uh, a couple of them reach out and say, is there anything that you can help, anything uh, research? And there's only, I think there's about 180 of these cases that are currently in the system. Um, of the cases, only four of them have been to trial, and ours was one mm -hmm. of them. Um, and the travel cases make up a, a subset of the ones that are providing or attempting to provide material support. So, I mean, my information is kind of limited, but I have researched a lot about terrorism and, it's, um, and how the State Department is attempting to combat it. As to your knowledge, is the Orange County, or is that where this was, trial was held? Was yes, it, Orange is County. Is that a particularly favorable or unfavorable uh, venue for a defendant such as Nader, or are there would there have been better jurisdictions if he had the good fortune of being of living somewhere else? Um, there are a couple of cases that they had successful results, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure what the uh, demographics of those are compared to Orange County. 
Um, I, I think Orange County, uh, the jurors are pretty well informed. Um, they seem to give very honest answers and they seem to be very open about discussing the issues that we had during voir dire. Um, but coming on the heels of San Bernardino, I think there, was, uh, uh, there were folks that were still a little bit uh, chilled by uh, the fact that ISIS seems to have uh, a, a long reach. Yeah, I'm going to break and uh, completely change topics. I've never served on a jury, but a few months ago I was called to be one of the 30 or 40 potential panelists. Every time a, uh, either side, whether it's the defense or the prosecution, asks me a question, I think and I hem and I haw and I prevaricate, I don't prevaricate, but I equivocate <laughs> and I can't make up my mind because I'm so, I try to be so open-minded and said, well, yeah, he said that, but is it true? And, and then they have not, they want no piece of me. I'm always kicked off the juries. Would you also want to have nothing to do with me on your juries? Or do you want to, this open-minded guy who's willing to listen to all sides? Or? I want, uh, well, it depends on the case. If, yeah. if it's a very narrow legal argument, uh, I would put my team to research the things that you've said online. Uh, we would try to find out as much as we could before oh, we made boy. that final cut. And, and I would much prefer someone to give me an honest uh, day's worth of deliberation, mm -hmm. uh, even if they find against us. But I want an, a, a, an honest approach to the issues that we're trying to present. And you, you don't have to agree with everyone. But if you, if you agree at all, if you have that doubt in your mind, uh, then I, I want you to be fair and not be swayed by the 11 other people who are screaming at you saying, what do you think you're doing? Right. Um, all we want in the defense side is honesty and, and, and a fair hearing. Because if we can get a fair at bat, I mean, that's most any of us can hope for. Not that anyone cares, but the case was fascinating. It was, ha occurred in Pasadena one uh, Christmas or New Year's. Two cars, both had known gang members in them, crashed. They both got out and started shooting each other and killed an innocent bystander. Yeah. No one has any idea who pulled the trigger and fired the bullet that killed that guy. They were all shooting at each other. Right. Yet they took these two guys, who I guess they had the most evidence or for whatever reason, and they brought them to trial. They were, there was a hung jury the first time. They tried them again. That's where I was called in to be a prospective juror, although they kicked me out. And uh, I think they were convicted in the second round. I thought that was a mess. Like, I don't know how they could f possibly convict these two guys in a big shootout like that. Well, it, it depends. Uh, are the, the charge that, you know, it's intentionally they, they killed this bystander or it's so reckless and, and negligent you're shooting so many bullets that yeah. there is a likelihood that you're going to shoot somebody. Well, that I can understand. The, the, I... the lesser included are there. Right. And, 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 and they fit that sort of scenario unless you can put, by ballistics, put bullet to gun. To gun, to, to gun mm. handler. Yeah. Right, and, and, and that the gun handler was actually attempting to shoot someone and missed, as opposed to cleaning the weapon. Of course, that wasn't happening, but you, know, right. you see that happens. Accidental yeah. discharge happens. Sure. And there's no murder involved. But here, in this situation, you know, we're having... Yeah, but okay, I don't know why we got uh, that. I, I find this whole uh, discussion that we've been having about prosecuting people for pledging support to these terrorist groups fascinating. We haven't even gotten into the whole issue of who decides what a terrorist group is. Uh, well, in this case, it's the U.S. government, and it's yep. clear cut, I guess. But, but a different government, Trump might declare some uh, groups, or have his State Department and Attorney General declare some terrorist groups that uh, an Obama or Clinton administration wouldn't have. It. I, I had this discussion with the FBI during both cases mm -hmm. um, because they kept referring to the Islamic State and ISIS and ISIL as this extremist group. And I go, what do you base that extremism on? Just so I know what you mean by extremists. Well, they behead people, and they set people on fire, and they cut, cut off people's hands, and they mutilate them. And I'm going, isn't that the normal punishment over there? Think about it. In Saudi Arabia, there was a crucifixion. I read this in the news from out there. Mm -hmm. There was a crucifixion two years ago. Now, if that's not extremist, yeah. then I'm not paying attention. But if it's okay in that geographical area, if that's the accepted means of how their criminal punishment works, the, the governments of Iran, the governments of Saudi Arabia, and some of the others will cut people's heads off, will cut off their hands, will set fire to people. If that's okay in those circumstances, how is it all of a sudden extremist because we disagree with their political aim? You know, the arguments you just made 
find a lot of favor in these four walls here at the Young Turks. But I do want to take issue with it a little bit, and maybe you can correct me. In Saudi Arabia, yes, where they behead people, that is the end result of their criminal process. I don't know how good their criminal process is or how fair it is. Right. But that's their method of execution after a process. ISIS just grabs people that some guy declares that they're an enemy and, and, they, and they kill them. I don't think there's as m very much of a process. So there is a difference, I think, between what Saudi Arabia does, as reprehensible as it is, and what ISIS has been doing the past couple of years, to the extent that I know. I, I'll, I'll give you an example that I gave also on Adam's case, uh, when they were talking about the beheadings, because I kept throwing the pictures up there of the beheadings. And I, we get it, okay, there's a lot of beheading pictures that are contained in the social media. But Thomas Jefferson himself spoke in favor of the use of the guillotine during the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. and, and he's not a terrorist, okay? He, no, he's he's as patriotic father. as they come, right. it, at least from my perspective. So I, it, it really comes down to which side politically or religiously you fall on. But what they're doing, okay, so, th so they've denied them the due process right of a trial. But that doesn't mean that the punishment isn't meted out in exactly the same way as the Saudi court would have meted out. They just cut through all of the lawyers and the appeals sure. and the right. motions. Well, to wrap it up on a light note, you bring up Thomas Jefferson. John Adams, also a patriot, second president of the U.S., defended in court the British soldiers who committed the Boston Massacre, and he won his cases. A lot of those soldiers were acquitted. Yeah, no, so, all of them. All of them, okay. And you are just following in that tradition, right? Uh, I'm sure you're pleased to feel that way. So. I, uh, I quoted his closing argument. Oh, in you mine. did? Okay, <laughs> perfect, all right. Well, uh, I find this whole subject to be fascinating, and I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me and the audience about it. My thank pleasure. you for coming in on TYT Interviews. N nice to be here.